Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be kicking off pretty darn soon here. We're talking about setting up a new normal. Who gets to control the new normal? The homestead strikes uh, and also the mutual aid revolution, an article that my friend Eleanor Goldfield has written uh, that I think people should be paying attention to. If you could hit that share button, hit that like button, tell some people uh, what we are discussing today and come join in the conversation. We are going to be kicking off in just a minute. All right, everybody. Uh, let's do it. Let's get into it. Let us dive into this week's episode of Road Reflections. I'm your host, Krish Mohan, still wearing sunglasses uh, because my eyeballs uh, need to not be directly dealing with the light and the screens and all that stuff. So still wearing sunglasses while I'm while I'm focused on the screens here. Um, let's let's do the check in. Let's do the check in at the top of the show here. Uh, I'm okay. A little bit of a frustrating morning, if if I'm if I'm being honest, uh, and I and I tend to in these in these sort of situations. Uh, difficult start to the day. It started kind of late. I've I've been waking up uh, later than I normally like to. Uh, I normally like to be up around like eight, seven thirty, eight o'clock, and I haven't been doing that. It's been it's been closer to nine thirty, and I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I, I, my assumption is that I'm, I'm probably more stressed out uh, than um, than I need to be. Uh, I I talked about this on a podcast on Saturday, but uh, you know mo- motivation is is very difficult in this time. So I'm trying to be forgiving to myself. I'm trying to take the time that I need. I'm trying to listen to, you know, the little signals from my body of like, okay, you've hit your limit. You know, you, maybe you shouldn't be looking at a screen right now. Maybe you should. Uh, lay down because your body kind of hurts or whatever whatever it is um, but uh, yeah I had a you know it's slower much slower start to my day than than I have in um, in quite some time even even through the the pandemic situation uh, basically had to cancel the rest of May perhaps that was uh, why my mind was kind of um, you know in duress uh, because I, uh, have to cancel like, you know, another, another three weeks of shows, uh, which officially puts me at two and a half months, two and a half months of no live performances, no touring. Uh, and that's, uh, kind of, that's, that sucks guys. It fucking blows. (laughs) Like what else can, there's nothing really else to say. Um, it really sucks. I am going to do my best in this week to um kind of figure out uh how to do a you know a um a uh i don't know a a zoom show that's that's sort of the um that's sort of the plan right now is to do is to try to do a a live some somewhat of a live stand-up comedy show and work out the kinks and then try to make that sort of a regular thing so uh, sorting out a, a a format for that is important, for one, but also uh, making sure that I know what the fuck I'm doing on a technological basis. Um, I'm still learning like two or three new pieces of technology to try to make these um, make these shows kind of more professional looking and and more I don't know just more engaging uh, than just me kind of staring into a screen and yelling at you guys about some stuff. Um, so there's been that, um, you know, so I think I've just been kind of a little bit more stressed out and, um, this has happened to me before where I kind of get stressed out and overwhelmed. And then the, the thing that happens to me is I end up sleeping a lot more because my mind is just like overwhelmed, but what really needs to happen is just me kind of doing the, the things that are overwhelming me to kind of get them off my table, uh, or get the, get the tasks off my table, so to speak. Right. Um, so that's going to kind of be the goal and I'm hoping that I can do that. I also kind of want to get back into exercising. I haven't really been doing a lot of exercising the last couple days, probably the last three or four days. I've kind of been more loungy, more, um, a little bit more, uh, for lack of a better term, lazy. So, uh, 
you know, I, I have, um, I have not been uh, diligent in terms of that either. And I think that's probably affecting uh, my overall like physical energy that I that I can output. I always feel better when I um, when I go for a walk or when I do, you know, ex- even if it's exercises in my room, I, I got an exercise ball that's all set up and ready to go that I'm excited to use. I just the motivation hasn't been there. And I think it's been a problem of overwhelming. And the other reason, too, is is you might notice that this video is late. Um, is because there was a very loud uh, machine thing happening outside of my window. Uh, basically, they were clearing the drain pipes outside uh, in my parents' apartment building. And they use a pretty large um, pressurized m- machine that throws water, like, you know, and clear off the mud from the drains and mud from the sidewalks and stuff. And because it's a large pressurized m- machine thing, I-, I don't really know what it's called for me to give you the, the actual word for it. Um, you know, it was very loud and I was going to record it and I, and I checked the levels and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was definitely picking up, like significantly picking up where I think it would have been louder than me just in talking to you guys. Um, so I didn't, I had to wait, you know, so I didn't start recording. I usually try to record these between like 1230 and 2 PM, um, and I'm, you know, it's like closer to three. So at least an hour, hour and a half later than what I wanted to because of this thing. So it was a very frustrating day. Um, kind of put me in a, in a bit of a funk for a minute. But I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I won't be I won't be stuck in this headspace. And uh, and and the second half of my day will be a lot more productive. And if I am going to, you know, if my body is going to um wake up a lot later than uh, what I think I'm going to try to do is just, you know, utilize my time in the evenings a little bit better. Utilize my time, you know, uh, towards the nighttime, even before bed, a little bit better with uh, doing some work, staying diligent, you know, and, um, and, and, and putting my mind to more productive use, um, you know, and, uh, and, and if, if I require that rest to wake up, at 9:30 in the morning as as I had been um the last week and a half or so um then you know I can better utilize my evening time instead of the morning time that's kind of what I'm going to attempt to do um anyway that's the little check in for for me to to kick things off um but I want to uh I have I have uh, I am going to be trying to do some new techie things that I'm that I'm learning Um, and then I'm, I'm very much like, once I learn it, let's do it. Let's put it into practice, uh, kind of person. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to do that. Hopefully it comes off, uh, not as awkward as, uh, as I would hope, but we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into the first story. So there's this whole idea of getting into normal, right? Let's get back to normal. Let's let's get back to normal life, uh, essentially. Everybody wants to get back to doing, you know, the things that they normally would do in a in a situation uh, like after a crisis. And I think, um, to me, you know, this notion of going back to normal um, isn't really going to help us out. Uh, and and I say that because what normal was, wasn't really working for a lot of us. And it's always like these pro-Western civilization, pro-capitalist people that like to deviate the argument away, um, you know, not really engaging the root cause of what the discussion really is, right? You you know, so if the, if the, if the problem is that, that there's a large chunk of people in the middle and in low income communities that aren't able to participate in this economic system that we've set up for ourselves and that the economic system isn't really even set up for them to participate in it, you know, the argument ends up being, well, look at this group of people that were able to do it and this group of people. So, you know, something's wrong with you, not this system. And if you pay attention to history, if you pay attention to how things have worked for 200, 300 years, um, it is a system, a systematic problem. 
um, you know, the, the core of it is still the same. The foundation of it is still the same. It's built in greed. It's built in unfairness. It's built in, uh, you know, excess. It's built in stomping over your neighbor's throat to get one step ahead. And if you don't do that, something's wrong with you. You're the one failing, not the system, right? When, when what, what the argument, you know, that myself and a lot of other people are saying is we need a new system that doesn't encourage that kind of behavior, that doesn't encourage this overwhelming level of poverty and claiming that we're living in the greatest country in the whole world. Um, and really, the, it's, it's going to come down to who determines what this new normal is, right? When we get out of this thing, are we going to go back to business as usual? Are we going to go back to this economy? Are we going to go back to the way things were? Or are we going to create something better? Now, people um, like Neil uh, Kashkari, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly or not, but he is the Minneapolis president of the Fed. Um, you know, he basically says that right now we are, um, we're looking at an 18 month track for social distancing. So that means that we are not going to get out of this until September of 2021. That's what, that's, that's his estimate. And, uh, and they're not looking, they're not really interested in being like, okay, if that is the way that things are going to be, what are we going to do to adjust things so that, you know, people are taken care of so people can still pay their rents, their mortgages, um, or, or have, you know, some kind of money to, to do that sort of stuff, right? Or have, have a level of income to do that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, the reason why that's scary is because of this. Um, right now, this article comes to us from the Daily Mail, uh, which I'm not, I, I can't, some people say it's conservative, some people say it's not, I, I don't really know, but this is, this is basically what they've reported here. Uh, in the last three weeks, the U.S. has suffered an excess of 16 million job losses, equivalent to nearly 10% of the nation's workforce. Um. And uh, as of Sunday night, there's over 22,000 uh, deaths from the coronavirus, and they're saying that the, the death toll can go up to 200,000 over the summer if uh, the stay-at-home orders uh, keep American indoors are lifted. So if, they're basically saying if, if, if we lift the stay-at-home order, things are going to get worse. Things are going to—we're we're, going to go from 22 to 200,000. Now— um, there is also the notion that if we do end up staying at home for as long as we do, and you know the um, the American healthcare system is not able to function the way that well, it doesn't really function very well to begin with, considering that you know there's hundreds and hundreds and millions of people that have health insurance, but you know when they go into the doctor, it's like they can't afford shit. It's like, okay, cool, like we still have, we st we're, we're still riddled in medical debt, even though we have, a, you know, something from the American Care Act or even from what, what is deemed as Trump care, right? Even if you have health insurance, it doesn't guarantee that um, you are not, uh, you are not going to be riddled and sacked with this immense amount of debt. Um, so that's the argument that they're making there is, but if we go back to, opening up these small businesses so people can afford what they have. People can afford uh, to go live their lives and support these small businesses and so on and so forth. Uh, the number of people dying is going to increase. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm not, I'm not sure. I honestly don't know. Because one of the things this Neil Kashkari gentleman keeps saying is, well, no one knows how this virus works. No one knows how this thing is really operating here. So it's difficult for us to predict the course of this thing. And, you know, whose fault is that? It's, it's, it's the fault of a system that doesn't, you know, particularly uh, listen to what scientists have to say uh, or particularly, um, you know, listens to logic and reason. It is more driven by greed. It's more driven by who's going who's gonna to validate the arguments of, 
uh, corporations and big businesses than it is anything else. There's records and evidence. Um, I mean, scientists have been claiming that there's going to be some kind of global scale pandemic for years now, for years. And no one really decided that, OK, maybe we should listen to what these scientists are saying and maybe we should put some, um, you know, put some plans in place um, that will uh, particularly make sure that if we need to go into um, more restrictive measures that people will be taken care of. Well, you know, the, the current system, the, the status quo system decided that that's not important. What we need to do is make sure that the markets don't fail. That's what we need to do. We need to make sure that people are still, you know, people are still fighting each other. Income disparity is still at an all time high. Um, you know, education is still on a systematic level controlled by the state, controlled by, you know, controlled by what we want the narratives to be, you know, all this shit. And, and that's that's the system that dictated what, what we need to do. And this is and this is why we're here. And everybody can sit there and say, oh, well, Trump, 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 you know, Trump got rid of the pandemic uh, planning committee. Well, Trump didn't do that in Italy. Trump didn't do that in the UK. Trump didn't do that in Korea. He did that in the States, and the States arguably is probably worse off on a systematic level than a lot of other countries, but that doesn't mean that other countries aren't dealing with this in, in their own particular way, they're, that they're not dealing with some similar challenges than we are. Um, and, you know, one of the things, and, and, this, is, and this is where the, where the difference comes in that this, this Neil guy talks about, right, is... Uh, by the way, the Fed, if you don't know what the Fed is, they're basically like the keepers of the American currency. They, they basically delve out money. They delve out the currency. They, you know, that's kind of what they do. They're a private company. They're a corporation that prints money. Um, and then they sell money. You know, they monetize money. They put a dollar value on the dollar. Go ahead and wrap your mind around that insanity. So this Mr. Mr. Kashkari, the, the president of the Minneapolis uh, Fed, has basically come out and say, well, he's really worried um, that, you know, going forward, people are not going to be able to pay their mortgages, uh, the, the, that people are not going to be able to pay their, um, their uh, you know, debts uh, to uh, the banks. And, you know, what that's going to do and people are not going to be able to pay their rents and the landlords are not going to have enough money to put money back into the bank, who, you know, the, to the to the loans they took out against for their buildings and things of that sort. And, you know, what do you what do we do then? If, if the banks aren't getting enough money, then what then then what then what do we do? What What's going to happen? So we're going to have to fortify the banks. That's what he keeps talking about when it comes down to it. We have to fortify the banks. The banks need to be fortified and um you know, that's that's sort of the thing that, that we have to do. And it's just like, well, what what about the people? What about the people? The people are the ones that are in trouble here. The people are the ones that that, you know, what it's really proving is that on a foundational level, the people are the ones that run the economy. And you brought the people to a standstill because they can't go out and spend money on the things that they need to spend into. Small businesses aren't getting help in this situation and that's what that's so so he points that out too right so we'll go back to this is um kashkari said uh, additional support was needed for small businesses beyond the 350 billion dollars provided in the coronavirus aid package passed in march but he was optimistic that congress would approve more funding to keep businesses from folding under the strain of social distancing measures when when the fuck when 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 have they done that what, 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 what historical evidence is there that when it comes down to it, Congress will be like, you know, what we really need to do is help out the American people. What, when the fuck has that happened? In 08, that didn't happen. In 08, people were like, we're going to fucking lose our homes. And they're like, I know, but the banks will be OK, though. So you can go back and start the whole process again. You know, the fucking problem that created the crisis in 08, we're just going to recreate it. We're just it's at. But isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting that we're going to recreate it for everybody? Right? 
And he goes, but then again, we don't know if the support is going to be long enough uh, because if we need to have different phases of shutdown for the next several months or until we have a therapy or vaccine, we're going to need more help than that. It, so this is a Face the Nation interview is what they're quoting here. And um, he keeps bringing up this notion of um, uh, of therapy which is, which, you know, is basically just this notion, like, therapy for what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, gene therapy? Like, therapy from what? I don't understand this notion of therapy. Or vaccine. So that's the other, but the vaccine is, again, it's like 18 months away. The behavior of this virus is changing. There, there is a very small study uh, that has come out to say that there might be three different strains of this vaccine, or, I'm sorry, the the virus and you know, so, um, you know, all this stuff is very confusing. And, and this is the part that blows my mind. He goes, meanwhile, the Federal Reserve is being aggressive in its approach to softening the blow of the pandemic's impact. Uh, Kashkari said, with the central bank announcing a number of new programs last week, lending as much as $2.3 trillion to businesses and governments. Yeah, it, 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 that's what we need. The Fed needs to be more aggressive in how it, it helps banks. That's what we need. His argument was that um, the Fed has to keep an eye on the banks because, uh, you know, he needs to for they need to fortify them more aggressively than they did in 2008, because um, that was the problem in 2008, is that they didn't create enough poor people uh, by bailing out money, uh, by giving more bailout checks to the banks that created the problem in the first place. That was the problem. That was the problem. And part of that problem was that, you know, we hit that crisis in 08, things got really bad, and there was a lot of this blame game thrown around, and then we went back to business as usual, where we didn't pay attention to any of this stuff. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to remind us and gaslight us. Uh, if you're not familiar with gaslighting, it's basically when uh, somebody says something like, uh, you know, it, it's like when a person is, will will actively do something terrible in front of you and you go, wait a minute, what the fuck did you just do? And they're like, I didn't do anything like that. And then they'll they'll spin their they'll continue to, to spin and spin and be like, no, I, I'm pretty sure I witnessed there's camera. No, 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 it's not. A it's not me. You know, they kind of it's basically like this masterful form of lying um, that's meant to uh, confuse the person accusing the other person of lying it's it's this sort of psychological torture tactic is essentially kind of what it is and that's what they're going to do they're going to keep claiming that we need to go back to that level of complacency where people aren't paying attention to politics and people used to get mad at me all the time for talking about political stuff um and you know and and you know talking about like labor movements or whatever bring up labor movements because that's what I've been talking about and it's kind of on the forefront of my mind here but people just get mad at me all the time you know like I don't get work at comedy clubs because of the stuff I talk about uh, there are certain venues that don't you know um it, 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 that, that don't book me because it's the stuff that I talk about there are certain comedians that don't like me because of the stuff I talk about they consider me not to be a comedian because of that you know like so but and and they basically go like why don't you just you know kind of just be the distraction that's what you should be you should just be the distraction they play in the commercials there's uh, this 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 huge fawning over like celebrity culture and trivialities and um, you know this huge championing of like anti-intellectualism that you can't be smart that you can't be in the know that you can't be on the pulse of things and and that's encouraged it's encouraged to be ignorant and and that's the that's the normal that they want to get back get get you back to is um is that level of complacency that level of that level of hubris and and anti-intellectualism and um, just disconnect with what's actually happening. This stuff affects your daily life. And this is what's important. This is why people talk about this all the time. Market shares, market, that has nothing to do with your daily life. But banks getting more money than you so that they're fortified makes absolutely no fucking sense. Why would you not fortify your foundation and we are the foundation. 
right? Because we have to pay the banks back. So why would you just funnel money at the top and not at your foundation? When you build, when you build a building, when you put a, a, a building together, you don't start with the penthouse and work your way down. That's fucking crazy. What are you going to build the penthouse on? You need a foundation to work off of. Well, we are the foundation. So why is a government structure not fucking helping the foundation, economically speaking? What Americans have to accept is that really what, what has happened um, and the culture is built around this and the history is built around this is that we've been gaslit. We've been gaslit by, by, these, by the people that control the Fed by the, and the Fed controls the government and the Fed controls the, this so-called economy. And we've been gaslit by them. We've been driven to this overwhelming fear-driven fucking trivial distracted lifestyle and that's gone that's done i don't think we have the luxury of doing that anymore i don't think we have the luxury of just kind of you know closing our eyes and holding our hands in the air and hoping that jesus or the government is going to is going to drive this country into a direction that it needs to be driven in which if they do that it will be off a fucking cliff because you have taken the wheels we as a people have taken the wheels off of the direction that this country is going to go and the car and the vehicle that is this country in this weird metaphor is going to wear off the road and fly off of a cliff and that's what's happening right now so the less people pay attention to this shit and the less people actually understand all this and the less people are actually connected to this the easier it is going to be for the system to collapse everything so now we have to make a choice. Is that normal is gone? That triviality, distracted, complacent normal is gone. And what we have to do is use our intellect, is actually think about things, is learn how to, how to form arguments, learn how to communicate with each other, look at a different model um, of living our lives, right? We're going to have to choose intellect over hubris. Uh, and that's understanding that perhaps something is wrong. You know, your nationalism is not really going to help you out here. Claiming that America is great, we're the best, greatest country in the whole world, doesn't fucking help the economy start back up. Doesn't really help figure out a cure for this virus. Doesn't really fi help figure out what is the most effective way of contending with this problem is it herd immunity okay if it is what what's the plan how are we going to implement that how are we going to organize a bunch of people to implement that right hubris doesn't do that the new normal is either going to be determined by we the people or the oligarchs that's what it's going to boil down to who's going to control this new normal right uh, so our new normal is, uh, I think, what, what I think we're mutually trying to work towards. If, if we the people have um, my, th this is sort of what my view is on, on what our new normal, the we the people's new normal would be, is a collective effort to ensure individual rights are respected and an economic economy of compassion, trust, and understanding using intellect, logic, and emotional understanding to advance technology ethically for societal uh, benefit. That's what I think we want to go for. You know, we want to create an economy that understands that, hey, sometimes you're going to go through a rough time. And when you do, it's, you know, we're not going to sit there and blame you and sit there and yell things like pull yourself up by your bootstraps or any of that kind of nonsense. We're going to sit, we're going to be here for you and, and say, look, you're going through a tough time and that's okay. Uh, we got your back while, while you, while you get, get, you know, uh, back up on your feet. We'll, we'll help you out a little bit. We'll cut you some slack. You know, this sucks. This sucks. We understand that. Um, if we're going to use technology, we're, we're going to make sure that the technology is used ethically and efficiently. Uh, we're not going to use it to arbitrarily spy on people. We're not going to use it to, you know, uh, t turn great amounts of profit for one person up at the top. We're, we're going to try to make sure that the entire society, uh, if they choose to, can actually use it for their own, for, for, for benefiting themselves, for, for mutual benefit, and, and make sure that it's not, you know, creating more problems than it's solving. The oligarchical new normal uh, is essentially a surveillance state of fear based on, con uh, on contact tracing, continuing to uh, distract 
the people with shiny new poisons to create an authoritarian state with, com you know, a whole populace of complacent people that'll walk right into it and create an economy on uh, competition and subservience. That's, I think, what the, the oligarchs want. What they want is to use, we talked about this yesterday with what Snowden's talking about by using apps and telecommunications um, to do contact tracing to, to find out who has been in contact with anybody that tested positive. And the problem with that is, first of all, you're going to actually have to test people, right? And, you're, and you can't force people to take a test that they can't afford. That's unethical. But this system doesn't care. It cares about profit. So it doesn't care about bringing you tests. It cares about forcing you into it. And a bunch of people are going to sit there and be like, well, you should get tested. You should figure out who's got it. It doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter. Well, you should fucking do that. And that's, and that's us blindly walking into authoritarianism by, by saying, well, of course these people should be getting tested. It doesn't matter what the cost of it is. Well, it does matter what the cost of it is. Because if they can't afford, if, they, if it's between getting tested and putting food on their child's plate, I'm pretty sure I know which one most people are going to choose. So which one sounds better? Our new normal? Of creating a new world? Of, of looking at, at, at the failures of this system that brought us here? Or to go back into a worse version of what was status quo? And, and walking right into it. Walking right into authoritarianism. I'll give you a second. Here's what I think is, uh, uh, I, f I forgot about this part. Uh, this is what I think is, is probably going to happen with the economy if we are on this Neil guy's, uh, in, you know, 18-month track is this. Um, I'm not an economist. This is just sort of my rough prediction is things were oh, plateaued and then they kind of went up and then they started going on this decline. So we're right there. We're in the middle of this decline, right? And then I think... Once we hit May, there's going to be just a sharp decline, and it's going to keep going, and it's going to keep going. Things are going to get worse, a lot more unemployment. It'll probably taper out for a little bit uh, over the summer when things start to look better, and then it'll start to come back up. And by the time we hit fall and winter again, we'll have to go back into another lockdown situation where businesses that are, are basically going to be screwed again, and they're going to be given an opportunity to take out loans, which is just going to is going to do what? It's not going to funnel money into the banks. People aren't going to be able to pay off loans, so why would they take loans? And you know, it'll dip us back again. We'll kind of play. So it's just there. It'll it'll. You're never going to see an economy that's actually like going to work in this model. It's just not a a long term solution. Um, you know, people and people are not going to be OK with this. People are not going to be OK with being cooped up inside, uh, not being able to, um, you know, uh, have a purpose and have a meaning and contribute to the world and contribute to their society in any which way. They're just not going to be able to sit there and do it. So really what needs to be done is creating a new normal. And that new normal, in my opinion, uh, is going to come from what we want. This collective idea. This idea that isn't driven on profit and and competition and you know stepping over your your neighbor to get one step ahead, it's not going to come from that. It's gonna we're all gonna have to pay a lot more attention. <laughs> you know, like when when we're surprised of like how are they doing all this? Well, they've been doing it for thirty years, um, and thirty years of economic history has brought us to you know, this fucking nightmare scenario that we're all dealing with. So maybe we should start paying a little bit more attention. Maybe we should start going beyond the corporate media narratives. Maybe we should, you know, take the corporate media for face value and then and then go listen to some alternative independent journalists that aren't funded uh, by, you know, Boeing and Raytheon and Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, all these people that have no no fucking interest in helping out the common man. 
what they do have an interest in is 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 taking every ounce of money um, and funneling it to the top and hoarding it all for themselves and then you know kind of sprinkling it back down and being like this is enough for you poors to 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 not revolt right this is we're good you're good you're fucking good that's not what we need we don't need this individualistic this rugged individualism bullshit all right kind of leads us into the next topic <laughs> Uh, which is the Homestead Strike of 1892. Um, I wanted to talk about this because I'm from, I'm, I live in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from India, but I, but I live in Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, this has been a part of, like, the city's history forever. Uh, so I wanted to talk about it because it is an important strike. And especially, like, it does give you some insight on stuff that I've, um, that I just kind of ranted and raved about in just a few minutes ago. Um, so there's a couple of important things to consider when we talk about the Homestead Strike of 1892, and everything actually starts a decade earlier. Uh, so the Amalgamate Association of Iron and Steel Workers, which was the union at the time, um, basically controlled the, the Homestead Steel Plant, and it uh, set a bunch of rules defining work and um, you know the bosses and Ar Andrew Carnegie. Um, and all these big giant like steel plant guys, um, they hated it. They hated these rules. They hated these rules because uh, it, it was a hindrance to maximizing outputs and profits. Basically, they couldn't work people to their bones. They couldn't work people to dire exhaustion uh, day in and day out, giving them pittance, giving them very little bit for that labor um, and collecting a large chunk of the profits for themselves. And... Um, the way this was achieved was, you know, starting in 1882, there was a bunch of strikes. Um, and through these strikes, uh, there was retaliation from law enforcement. The sheriff's office got involved. A bunch of, a bunch of you know, regular people were deputized. There was a bunch of violence. Um, and particularly in Homestead, in Homestead, Pennsylvania, um, the 2,000 town pe townspeople stood in solidarity every time there was a strike. And they achieved the right of collective bargaining. And that collective bargaining is what gave them these defined work rights uh, that, the, that the bosses hated. And this was in 1889. Um, and then three years later, they would uh, come back to the collective bargaining table and, you know, talk about what's working, what isn't. Let's negotiate something that is conti like continually trying to make things better um, for the workplace, right? That's that was sort of the 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 way that this was set up. Now, Andrew Carnegie it was was essentially the way that Andrew Carnegie is seen is fraudulent. Um, he publicly would sit there and say, "Oh, I support the unions. I think they're great. They're good people." Um, and then you know would be like, "What we need is this Christian brotherhood in this country because America is built on this Christian." brotherhood right and uh, because he came because he spoke to these people because he came from um, from a life of poverty he was an, he was an Irish immigrant and he struggled um, but uh, you know he 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 got to the top uh, by making these like ruthless business deals by essentially stepping over his neighbor by by putting the boots to people's throats that's just how he operated um, and he's reviled for it, right? Like, uh, or, or revi is reviled the right word for this? Um, but, but everybody thinks of him as this great person that built this city, you know, that, that he's somebody revered. He's revered for it, um, not revi revered for it, right? Everybody kind of uh, puts him up on this pedestal. Uh, you know, we have a we, we have a, a school here, Carnegie Mellon University, and he's obviously his name is is in there we, there's a bunch of libraries that have his name associated with it and everybody thinks he's a mate because he because he was cutthroat right he he and and this is something that people um people kind of want you know this is the culture that is bred in america because we look at these people as heroes we look at these people as amazing people people that that you know were, were cutthroat and ruthless and didn't give a shit about their fellow man and then on on a public basis would talk about brotherhood would talk about coming together and solidarity and all this shit right but in reality they didn't they didn't live their life like that you know so um, Carnegie 
made all these speeches. He built these, you know, built these libraries and would talk about it. And, but in private, a lot of what he was talking about were crushing the unions. He was a, he hated collective bargaining. He hated collective bargaining. Um, he thought collective bargaining was a waste of time. And uh, he, he was basically like, why would, um, why would I want collective bargaining when I'm the one that built this empire by myself? You know, the employees didn't go out there. These, these fucking skilled and unskilled laborers didn't go out there to, to make these crushing investment blows. I fucking did that. I'm the one that, that made all this shit happen, right? So he, and he basically said, I'm the one that um, determines what these workers do. So he kind of had this very like dictatorial view um, on employment, and and this and this is the guy that we all revere, right? This is the guy that we're supposed to be like, oh, he's the best. Look at this guy, huh? This guy's gonna fucking shiv you in the night, you know? He's gonna be, and that's 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 what you gotta do. That's success right there, you know? Is fucking backstabbing, ruthless, a fucking uncaring, sociopathic shit. That's fucking amazing. That's what we need, is and that's how it's seen. Now, um, he put. He didn't physically go to the homestead plant, right? Like, he was never at the homestead plant. Uh, but he put a guy named Henry Clay Frick in charge of the home plant, homestead plant. And now publicly, again, he was going out there making union solidarity speeches, and he said he would never use strike breakers. If it came down to a strike because collective bargaining had failed, um, he would never use strike breakers. He would try to figure out a way to make sure that these people were taken care of. That was, that was the way that he operated. But on, on a private notice, um, he told Frick to never, um, never legitimize the union again. Basically make sure that you don't give in to collective bargaining um, and you make the union look foolish and you, and you delegitimize them. Don't recognize the union's demands. And he said this privately, and Henry Frick never released it because Henry Frick... Uh, basically, you know, believed the same thing that Andrew Carnegie believed. He believed that, you know, that's the way that you do business. If you want to succeed, you got to step over the corpse of the other guy. You know, you don't help somebody that's in trouble. You fucking make sure that they are dead. That's the way that that's the, that's their business. And, and that's revered. Again, this idea that this this notion of, of callousness and this real, like, this sociopathy and, and then basically d this dictatorial mentality of running the workplace, um, you know, is, is sort of what's championed. Um, and, and, and this is the mentality that's continually championed in America, and that's why we're in the current situation that, that we're in. Um, now, within the homestead plant itself, 800 out of 3,800 workers by 1982 were represented by the AA union. Right, which is that amalgamated association of iron workers and steel workers. Uh, but we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, regardless of whether you are a, uh, a card carrying, due paying member of the union, the unions are going to represent everybody. They represent every single worker. That's what they do. You know, they're they're not just going to represent a couple of people. No, that's they they represent everybody. Whether whether you pay into the union or not, um, the unions. And, the, and, you know, the, the union leaders are going to go to bat for you, uh, at, at, you know, as, as, as an employee of uh, a particular trade, a particular skill, a particular industry, and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, they ramp up the, the collective bargaining talks. And they're like, hey, you know, this is what we think needs to happen. This is our list of demands for going forward. We, you know, some things worked, some things didn't. We'd like to change it this way. Um, and Frick basically was not like he was ordered to do. And, and he personally believed that the unions were all shit. They were all bullshit. Um, so he responded by cutting every worker's pay by 22%. He's just like, yeah, we're done. I'm not listening to your bullshit. Everybody gets less pay. And that's how it's going to be, right? Carnegie kept telling him that you know, hey, make sure that you keep blocking their negotiations. Don't listen to what they have to say. Don't legitimize their their demands uh, because they're a hindrance to efficiency. Um, you know, the way that you get, obviously, obviously, 
the way that you get efficiency out of people is by overworking them, making sure they're completely exhausted, completely burned out, you know, so that they're mentally and physically um, ex just totally burned out and to the point where, yeah, they're probably going to make some mistakes along the way. And that's efficient. That is efficient. And if they make mistakes, you kill the worker because they're, what you know, they're just... They're just tools and peons to make Andrew Carnegie and all these fucking sociopathic uh, rich people more rich. That's all. That's all that really matters. Uh, what gives a shit about your you know, about your fellow man? Sure, you publicly say that, but privately, uh, you know, you wish death upon their family. That's America, and that's how you gotta do it, baby. That's how you play the game. That's how you get successful. That's how you beat the virus. Obviously. So, Frick, Frick basically, uh, there were 30 days to negotiate something. And, uh, and he just refused to negotiate with them. He wouldn't look at their list of demands. He wouldn't legitimize it. Uh, so, uh, basically, at the end of that 30 days, if there wasn't a collective bargaining agreement reached, the unions would no longer be legitimate. They no longer would have any power. Um, and they would have to dissolve. Yeah. So uh, he literally locked out the workers because because of the unions. He locked them out. He built this huge like wooden fence with barbed wire on top, and then he got these steel plates with snipers in these steel plates, and some. And then he also had like hot wa uh, boiling hot water uh, cannons that if um, if any of these workers tried to come into the into the the plant, he would, you know fire uh hot water at them so so the workers see this and they make a, a declaration uh to strike that was led by uh what is his name here i'm uh H huey o'donnell huey o'donnell was the leader of the strike um and uh and this is what the declaration says so let's read let's read that make sure that everybody could see this declaration we got to move it a little bit Every screen is different, uh, but basically this, the, the employees in the mill of uh, Mercer's, Carnegie, Phipps, and Company at Homestead, PA have built there a town with its homes, its schools, and its churches for many years, been faithful co-workers with the company and business of the mill, have invested thousands of dollars in saving, it, it, savings in said mill in the expectation of spending their lives in Homestead and of working in the mill during the period of their efficiency. Therefore, the committee desires to express to the public as it, its firm belief that both the public and the employees uh, af aforesaid have equitable rights and interests in the said mill, which cannot be modified or diverted without due process of the law, the, that the employees have the right to continuous employment in said mill during the efficiency and good behavior without regard to religious, political, or economic opinions or associations, that it is against public policy and subversive of fundamental principles of American liberty that a whole community of workers should be denied employment or suffer any other social determinant on the account uh, of membership in a church, political party, or trade union, that it is our duty as American citizens to resist by every legal and ordinary means the unconstitutional, archaic, and revolutionary policy of Carnegie Company, which seems to invite a contempt for public and private intent, interests and a disdain for the public conscience. Boom. Strike declaration. So they basically were like, you guys are, you guys are doing something illegal. You know, you guys are, you guys are not upholding the law. We have a right, uh, to employment for this mill. We, we have given our life to, to essentially make this mill money to, and, and we do, we do efficient work. We have been doing efficient work. Um, so what you guys are doing is, is illegal. It's not correct. Um, you're taking employment away from us, uh, because we are part of a trade union and that's, uh, that's not correct. That's discriminatory. Um, and it is discriminatory, right? Because they were they worked with AA. Uh, Henry Frick basically built this uh, this prison complex. He built a prison complex um, that they all nicknamed Fort Henry, by the way. 
right? So he builds this thing and he locks them out and he expects them to just be fine with it. Uh, and, you know, the what other recourse did they have? They tried the collective bargaining and then they and then when it failed, the, the you know, uh, Henry Frick is like, well, your union doesn't matter. It's not important anymore. And then he builds a fucking prison tower around it. And he's like, well, now everything's fair. So you cut wages. You don't you don't consider the unions to be legitimate. And you also lock your employees out. Um, and then he brings strike breakers. In. So all this is like essentially making Henry Frick look like an asshole. You know, um, meanwhile, Carnegie is going around giving speeches, talking about Christian brotherhood and all this shit. Right. Um, so in order, so the, the strikers build a, a human wall to make sure like none of the strike breakers can actually get into the, into the, uh, into the plant so that they, you know, they can make money. Uh, now Carnegie before all this, because he figured that they would probably strike because that's what happened before he overworked them. Um, he, he increased the productivity and efficiency of the plant. Um, you know, because that, because again, that's, that's a ruthless business decision, right? So you're like, ah, I see the plant coming. So I'm going to, I'm going to fucking overwork the shit out of you guys. I'm going to make sure that I'm ahead on everything that I need to, because I'm seeing this thing coming. Um, and if I overwork you anyway, that's just, you know, you're, you're going to do it anyway. So I might as well overwork you kind of, kind of a thing. So, uh, in order to protect these strike breakers and continue to make even more money, um, Frick hires the Pinkerton guards. The Pinkertons uh, were basically the mercenaries of that time. They were like the Blackwater of that time, right? And they were hired to protect the strike breakers, and they were going to come up through the Monongahela River because it was kind of secluded. Not a lot of people knew about that. And then they were going to go up the hill and make their way into the plant. Now, they, they hired these Pinkerton guards... Despite the fact that, um, you know, the union leaders, um, uh, Huey O'Donnell had, had said that they had no intention, um, of, you know, uh, getting violent, but they will take up the, but they're going to protect themselves. Uh, they're going to take protective measures, but they have no intention of getting violent. And, uh, you know, <laughs> these guys come up. And they had to do something, so they barric like they formed a human barricade. They they showed up to the Monongahela. This is July sixth, eighteen ninety two. And uh, somebody fired. It's it's unsure as to who fired. There's a lot of people that say, well, the union, you, you know, the union organizers are the ones that fired. The strikers are the ones that fired first. Um, there's others that say it was the Pinkerton guards. No one really knows. It's one of those things that's very disputed uh, amongst historians. But the the general consensus is that we're not sure who did it. Somebody fired and all hell starts breaking loose. Now, the thing to remember here is um, the union organizers and the Pinkerton guards themselves are not soldiers, right? The union, organi or, uh, the, the, the union organizers and, and the strikers are just workers. They're just employees. They work in the, they work in the fucking mill. That's where they work. Right, the Pinkerton guards were were just desperate out of work people. That's who they hired. So they pay them like two fifty a day, um, which is like a hundred bucks a day, right? And uh, and make sure that they're fed, um, and and that's why they would go. So some of these people that were there are just regular like out of out of work people or students. Some of them were students trying to earn enough money um, over the summertime to pay their way through the fall uh, semesters. Right. Which is crazy, which is, again, it's just like there's no reason why in the American economic system that somebody should either join a mercenary group or a fucking uh, or the military in order to afford school. Like that should not be the um, the reasoning to, to join the military. You know, the military shouldn't be like this financial hostage situation to be like, oh, if you come join us and go put your life on the line for a bunch of rich people, then we'll pay your way through school. We'll give you enough money that you can afford school. And it shouldn't be the, it's the same way for, for these fucking Pinkerton guards, right? It says, oh, come fight on behalf of uh, Henry Frick and Andrew Carnegie, and we'll make sure that you're paid for 
you know, your way through school. We're, we're, we'll make sure that you're fed, even though that you're not now. Like, that should not be a thing. It, it's very opportunistic, and it's very callous, but it's championed. It's revered. This guy's a good business guy. He's a fucking good business guy, this guy. You know, whole, the financial hostage situation? That's good business, this guy. He's a genius. Put him, put him on, put him on some kind of currency. This fucking guy. Now the strikers also had acquired a cannon. <laughs> I was like, where the fuck did you guys get a cannon from? Uh, but none of them knew how to operate it, and you know it backfired on them, and uh, somebody got hurt. This was a fucking disaster. This, the, this, this whole battle um, on July six was a disaster, right? It, there was a point where. The strikers controlled the plant, and then there was a point where the Pinkertons controlled the plant, and it just kept going back and forth. But eventually, the Pinkertons surrendered, and they were like, look, a bunch of people are dying. There's a bunch of people that are uh, injured. We're not sure if this is friendly fire or not. This is crazy. So we're getting the fuck out of here, right? And that was, that was a day. Like, that whole day was a goddamn disaster. So on July 7th, the PA State Guard gets called in. And um, basically... Huey O'Donnell was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll treat them like they're people, right? I'll go, I'll go say hello. I'll, I'll try to shake the general's hand. We'll try to have a little bit of a, a, a conversation. Maybe they're willing to do some collective bargaining situation, right? Maybe they're willing to listen to, 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 to all, all us workers here. And um, at first, you know, the original general was kind of like, I don't want to really do much of anything. But once he saw that there was... Uh, so much support he was like okay like the whole town was supporting these union people and he was basically like we got to do something because we're paid to protect the interests of rich people and these guys are not in the interests of rich people so four thousand soldiers uh, surrounded the town that supported these unions um that supported the strikers and uh you know he o'donnell tries to go talk to them and it doesn't work, um, and by force, the strikers get broken up. The, the whole thing gets broken up. This is basically like um, if, you inv if you got like, invited uh, a friend of yours over for dinner, but instead of actually just coming over for dinner, uh, your friend invites the local gun club to surround your house um, and then takes your wife and children hostage um, and asks you to stop being unreasonable. That's kind of what this situation is. So uh, by July 12th, the strike was done. It collapsed. It was over. Uh, you know, so lasted a little over a week, I think. Uh, July 18th, Homestead goes under martial law uh, under the order of Henry Frick. And during this time, there was an anarchist uh, named Alexander Berkman, uh, kind of misguided didn't really plan this out very well uh he was married to emma goldman um who i'm a fan of emma goldman um uh, from what i've read I've, I've i've read a little of emma goldman not a significant chunk of what emma goldman um has to say but from what i've read i like uh but this seems like this wasn't particularly great on her part um but they planned it together and he came down from new york and he was going to assassinate henry frick right uh, he was going to kill Henry Frick. And he fails. Because he'd never fired a gun before. Right? And, uh... Yeah, he never fires a gun. Uh... And he, and he, like, grazes his neck or something. And the union organizers, you know, Huey O'Donnell and everybody, are just like, Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, this, fu this guy is not part of our movement we don't want to associate ourselves with him. But, you know, the damage was done. The Union started losing support after this um, assassination attempt. And uh, basically, whatever Carnegie had set up before the strike began is how things continued to move forward. Uh, so, the, so the unfortunate thing was that the Union's lost in this situation. I mean, they gained traction, too. You know, they'd gained collective bargaining rights. They were, they were starting to do, you know, starting to get some provisions for the workers that were going to treat them like, you know, just regular people. Um, and uh, the union leaders get charged with conspiracy. And Frick took all the heat. He took all the heat, right? Henry Frick 
got all the heat. He was called a tyrant. He he was called, uh, you know, a, a, he like betrayed the people. Um, a bunch of people started turning on Henry Frick. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the separation of the manager versus the owner. You know, uh, there was a very clear separation of the manager versus the owner because Andrew Carnegie knew that this was going to look bad. Yeah, he he knew that this was not gonna he he wasn't gonna look great. So he's going around fucking opening up libraries and shit. You know, get getting museums for the people, talking about Christian brotherhood and solidarity and how he loves unions and they're the best. You know, I, I, I got a friend of mine in the union. You know, one of my one of my best friends is a union organizer. One, you know, I had a I I knew a cousin once that uh, that thought about joining a union and then said fuck it, I'll just work in terrible conditions and and that's christian brother and he's going around saying shit like that so everybody on a, on a public level saw andrew carnegie to be amazing but in secret he's talking about busting up unions he's 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 you know um saying that they're a hindrance that he wants them crushed that he wants them left without any power i'm the i'm the fucking sole person that decides how these workers should be treated because i'm the one making all the money you know, so very real sociopathic stuff. And then he sold this guy who believed the same thing that put his, essentially put his life on the line. He sold him down the river, all three of them. So um, Frick was seen, you know, as the raw nerve of, of vengeance, you know, this, of, and he became like the face of uh, capitalistic greed. Um, and he was used as a scapegoat. He got vilified in the press as somebody that's like that, you know, used force to bust up these unions and, um, you know, f uh, under 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 Carnegie's order, um, he denounced the unions and he cut wages for for the people of Homestead. Um, and this is and this is sort of the the tipping point of Frick and Carnegie's relationship which is uh, Carnegie's opening up this new library in Homestead, which I'm pretty sure is still there. Um, and while he's opening up uh, the library, he makes this big speech and he basically says, you know, if, if I had been in charge, if I was the manager um, of the plant during the strike of 1892, um, there would have been no violence. I would have, I would have happily collectively bargained and uh, I would have I would have happily listened to what the workers have to say because you guys you guys are the fucking best you know I fucking love you you guys are great look at this library I built for you I, I put ten books in there you know and one of those books uh, has to do with that uh, you know socialism thing I, I I mean I put a red tape around it but it's there you know it's in there nobody should read it but it's in there. You know, so he basically claims that he would have had, had no violence. He would have been amazing. And uh, and Frick basically goes, well, fuck this guy. I'm done with him. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. So he so they basically go grow strange. They stop talking to each other. So in 1919, um, which was a big year for for the labor movement, you know, you had the Seattle general strike, you had the Winnipeg general strike, you had the Boston police strike, you had a bunch of different other strikes that popped up because of that uh, all around the country. And then you also had the deathbed of Andrew Carnegie all happening in 1919. Big, big year for labor movements there. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, you know, was missing his old friend and... Uh, it, you know, it felt really terrible about not seeing Henry Frick as, as much and basically was like, I want to make amends. I want to talk to, to my friend Henry Frick, which this is how out of touch he is. This is how out of touch fucking Henry Frick is, right? Or I'm sorry, Andrew Carnegie this is how out of touch he is. He sold his friend down the river, this guy that was loyal to him this whole time, right? And just sold himself down the river so he can look good and but and you know privately bust the union and collect all the profits and become super rich and give nothing back to the people right he didn't realize what he had actually done to henry frick or the or the people um and is and is sitting there pretending like oh man i miss this guy he was so great he was so good i hope he'll talk to me again i hope he'll talk to me again uh so you know carnegie's people send a message to henry frick and Frick writes, uh, writes back uh, this. He says, please tell Mr. Carnegie I will see him soon in hell where we are both going. Because 
Henry Frick, I think, realized what he had done. That um, by treating the workers the way that he had, just based on that quote, you know, uh, by treating the workers the way that he had, um, you know, he, he, really, he really failed to, to be a good Christian, uh, to, to, to stand by his fellow man. Um, and he had also realized that he pledged allegiance to the wrong person. He pledged allegiance to a, a greed monger. Someone that wasn't going to ever help him out. And someone that still doesn't realize what they've done. On your deathbed, too. On your deathbed. Um, you know, so my... When I look back on this sort of stuff, um, I look at Andrew Carnegie as the representation of what... Um, what capitalism really is, what we are championing as a society. Uh, if we go back to the earlier part of our conversation, the earlier portion of the video uh, where we talked about the new normal, um, Andrew Carnegie represents the oligarch oligarchical normal. You know, this guy really represents um, the status quo, what we, what we are aiming to achieve, this greed-driven capitalism that, that kind of runs the country, this, this reverence that we have for people that have no compassion, that have no idea of building a collective future for humanity. Uh, they, they do have an idea of, of how to capitalize on uh, other people's work and other people's labor. They do have an idea of masquerading as champions of democracy, but really wanting to run uh, you know, the, their, their industry with a dictatorial iron fist. A, a fist that I'm sure their that that their workers made uh, and received very little, if if any, of the profit. That's who Andrew Carnegie represents. So, all right, um, I want to talk about this because this is. I I feel like this is some good news. And this is our final story. If maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't save it. I want to. I goofed up and I probably didn't save it. So let me see if I can do that in in tow. But uh, I think this is a very important story to talk about in our society right now, uh, because you know, um, I don't. I don't think people really realize what's going on. And a little bit of good news is is important uh, and necessary right now in our, uh, you know, in the current state of things. Um, and, and I'm going to bring you good news in the best way that I can bring you good news. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to, uh, I feel so bad that I, but I, I, it's a, can you tell I'm a little scrambled today because of all the things, uh, because of the way that the day started, I guess. <laughs> Let's see if I got it. Yeah, there we go. Mutual Aid Revolution. That's what I want to talk about. Um, so a, a, a good friend of mine, Eleanor Goldfield, if you don't know Eleanor, um, she, she used to run a show called Act Out, a fantastic uh, activist news program. Uh, she has a book called Paradigm Lost. She's a, a, a wonderful spoken word artist. She, is, uh, she, was, she was the lead singer of Rooftop Revolutionary. Uh, highly recommend you check out Eleanor's work. Uh, Eleanor Goldfield just wrote a piece in the Mint Press News, another fantastic uh, journalistic organization, about mutual aids. Um, and right now, um, you know, there's a lot of people that need help uh, that aren't getting help. Food banks are not being... Um, they're, they're not being helped as much as you would think. Uh, there's a lot of people out of work. There's a lot of people hungry. And these social programs that are, in, that are being put into place are, uh, they are being stressed out. Uh, and they wouldn't be stressed out had the government, ha had, had we had a government and an economic system that doesn't, you know, thrive on um, this this level of competition that it does, this level of callousness that it does, it thrives on it. When, when compassion and understanding um, are put 
in the forefront of it, this economic system dies, essentially. Um, and as it's dying, it'll try to fight compassion with militaristic force. Uh, that's usually what happens. But mutual aids are, are, are basically the counterpoint to that, right? So Eleanor wrote a, a wonderful piece in Mint Press News that I, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to it at the, at the bottom. Um, so you guys can you guys can uh, read the article for yourselves and and uh, learn more about mutual aids and um, you know if you're looking for a way to uh, to serve your community and to 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 uh, to, to be a, a part of something big um, you, you know and you, and you have the time and you have the resources and you have the ability to do it uh, you know look into these things these are these are these are ways that we're all going to help each other these are ways that we're all going to get through. Uh, and, and if you can't, that's okay too. You know, do do what you can. That's sort of the spirit of the mutual aid. Do do what you can to help your fellow man. Uh, if if that involves, you know, calling your friend and checking up on him, and and saying how you doing, buddy, and and just kind of talking about what's going on, and and ha and being, you know, a a vehicle uh, for your friend to kind of verbally and vocally let out some of their mental stresses, then that is part of the mutual aid spirit. You are doing something to help somebody out, you know? Um, so I want to read a little part of uh, Eleanor's article from uh, Mint Press News here. Uh, let me make sure I have this thing set to the right one. Uh, sorry, I know I'm, I'm kind of working with with some newer technology, so it's going to be a little little kinky and um, you know not not running as smooth as I would like it to. So here's here's what she responds to um, in terms of mutual aid, in terms of what mutual aid is, right? Uh, so mutual aid is the medicine that bodies uh, respond well to, the antidote to capitalism. And the salve for the basic elements of humanity so ruthlessly shanked by our system. Solidarity, community, sharing, and supporting. It's not about charity. Charity pities. Mutual aid understands. Charity distances. Mutual aid connects. That's, that's the gist of mutual aid. Um, providing any sort of help that you can. For your fellow man and there's mutual aids all over the country uh you know it 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 really cuts through that notion that uh we are too busy to help each other because that's kind of the thing that capitalism likes uh to to remind people is that nah, we're just a little bit too busy we're just a little bit too busy to help each other we're a little bit too busy to pay attention right um that's sort of the andrew carnegie way of doing it is keep the worker underpaid and overworked so that they don't have time to think that they're being fucked at the end of the day. Um, and mutual aids kind of cuts through that bullshit. And at this point, too, is is we're just not being paid, period. A lot of people just don't have jobs, period. So we have a lot of time, and now we're just absorbing all this information. Um, and then we're, we're also, on top of that, scared. We're... Uh, socially distanced, we're isolated, and you know some people are living alone, um, and you know don't have somebody to bounce things off of, or they're living in in, in conditions that are not, you know, um, completely the best situation to be in. Um, so you know, it, th this is this is the time that we kind of need each other. This is the time that we don't have, we don't we we don't really need to say that, hey, I'm too busy to help you out. I'm too busy to to listen to what's going on to you. I'm too busy to, uh, to 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 provide you with any sort of resources or anything like that, right? Mutual aid cuts through all that bullshit because it's 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 us helping each other out. That's you know it's in the name itself, mutual aid, right? And the way it works is is it's completely decentralized community organization. Uh, that's particularly has one goal and one mission, and that is to help each other. That's it. Uh, so how do they do that? Uh, you know, every every mutual aid is is a little bit different. You know, uh, there's going to be some members of of our community, uh, some members of our township, our wards, our neighborhoods, whatever it is, 
uh, that have a little bit more than others do, right? And uh, those that do have a little bit more um, or, or haven't, you know, lost a lot of financial uh, resources in this troubling time give to these mutual aids um, and the mutual aids get it to people that they know need it or they connect somebody that is a little bit financially better off with somebody that isn't. Uh, they kind of know that somebody within a community has a skill and their skills are kind of not being utilized in the best way. So they can kind of go to that other person that needs that skill and be like, hey, you two should connect. They become this bridge. That's what mutual age groups do. And they're decentralized. They're not working with the government. They're not working with law enforcement. Um, they're not working with, uh, you know, and why would they, right? Like, why would anybody work with this government? Why would anybody in a mutual aid group work with a government that's like, no, banks are more important. And they need to be fortified. These corporations really need our help. I'm, yes, these corporations make trillions and billions of dollars every single year, but they really need that help to hold on to those billions. Fucking why? Isn't this the reason why you have those billions in the first place? Isn't this the reason why you save and hoard all that money? So when it comes down to an emergency situation, you can actually utilize that money for a better purpose. But they're not doing that. But these mutual aids... Um, these mutual aid groups are, these mutual aid groups are coming together to help people within their communities. Um, so Eleanor is in D.C. and her, uh, the D.C. mutual aid is uh, led by women of, co women of color and uh, they're broken up by wards. And there's, a, 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 in a lot of these situations, the, the driving force, um, you know, the, 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 the people that kind of organize um, and their and their purpose is to organize, and they're very good at it. Are are usually women of color. The the Black Panthers, um, once the survival programs were put into place, uh, the Black Panthers uh, survival programs were run by rank and file women of color. That's who was doing it. So you know this is not, um, and and it's not and and look the, and that's part of the thing too, right? Part of the thing is. Mutual aids aren't this exclusively different thing. They, um, they, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, for example, the Black Panther Survival Program. That was kind of like a mutual aid thing. That was just people in the community coming together to make sure that, you know, uh, people are getting the right medical services. They're getting, their children are getting fed before they go to school. Um, doing things like that, hot, for, uh, paying for hospital rides. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, ambulance rides, right? Like that was all, that, that's basically what uh, this mutual aid program is. And it's different in, in, um, in every community. There's really no hierarchy, but the common goal, like the, the, the little nuances of everything are a little bit different. Um, they could be working by phone number. You know, some people might go uh, and deliver things by biking. They might uh, have some sort of community center where people can donate to. Every, every little bit is different. The organization elements are a little different. Uh, but, they're, but their sole focus is, uh, you know, common, um, common good for humanity and solidarity, that we as a community stay together. Um, and, you know, the, the philosophy really comes from uh, the, the notion that you would go to your neighbor to borrow a cup of sugar, right? Hey, I didn't have time to run to the grocery store today, and I'm trying to, you know, it's my kid's birthday, I'm trying to make cake, uh, and I'm not going to have time to run to the grocery store and pick them up from school. Can I borrow, can I borrow a cup of sugar? And your neighbor's like, fuck yeah, why would, yeah, of course you can, you know? It's the same thing. There have been certain times where, you know, the comedy community has really come through for me and I've done the same thing for them is, oh, you're going through a, a difficult time. You need a little bit of help getting through this. Yeah, I got you. I might not have money, but you know what? Let me let me see if 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 I can connect to, you know, people that follow my work and see if they can't throw five bucks at you. Um, I'll share it on this. I'll do this. Let me make a phone call for you. And people come together and they and they help each other out. That's what mutual aids are. That's why you should support them if you can. Um, I hope that the, I know St. Louis, Florida, D.C., uh, a bunch of cities have them. Um, I have. Uh, I'm going to use the excuse that I shouldn't use. Um, things have been crazy. 
Uh, so I have not had the opportunity to look them up, but I am going to. I have the link pulled up here. Uh, but and and Eleanor is an amazing resource resource for it. Um, you know, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna read a little bit. Uh, this is the this is this is the end of of Eleanor's article. Again, it's a fantastic read, and there's there's a lot in there that I think you should really check out. Um, and uh, I'll link it. I'll link it in the comments and stuff. Uh, but here's here's the the uh, you know the the conclusion. I I really like the the way that she has put this together. So Arundhati Roy, fantastic writer, by the way. You should check out Arundhati Roy. Uh, Arundhati Roy wrote in a recent article that the pandemic is a portal, and we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and our hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and our dead ideas our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. The question our communities must consider is how do we walk through? How do we organize when the system beckons like a Pied Piper to go back to quote unquote normal? How do we bolster these aid networks against internal burnout and external onslaughts of bureaucracy and harassment. These aren't rhetorical questions, but I don't have the answers. I have some answers and more ideas. I know others do too. And it is only in the collective rush of these veins, the pulse of these places, that we'll figure out what works. We'll have to flesh it out and as it were, and combine our rhythms, our beats, to a deafening roar, a symphony of voices, the will, the power of the people. Mutual aid is our roadmap through the, that portal. How we walk is up to us. How we walk is up to us. And we have to make that choice. Uh, so right now is the time where, you know, if you have the opportunity, if you have the means to, in any which way, in any which way, it does not have to be financial. It could literally be, um, you know, you know a friend or, or an elderly person in your community or, or someone that's just a little scared and they need, you know, some food. You make some food, boom, set it by their doorstep. You know, you need a friend that just needs an ear, stressed out, freaking out a little bit. Cool, give him a call. You know, you need some knowledge. So you go and listen to somebody that, that has a little bit of knowledge and goes, hmm, this is interesting. Support each other. Be good to each other. Uh, you know, let's not do the exact opposite of what Andrew Carnegie did. Be the exact opposite of what Andrew Carnegie was. That's what we can do. We can walk through that portal and we can choose to walk through it in a completely new manner, in a manner that is led with, uh, with compassion, understanding, love, mutual respect, and solidarity. And we don't all have to be these isolated islands of individualistic ruggedness that has gotten us fucking nowhere. And that, my friends, is uh, is how we are going to conclude today's episode. <laughs> Bit of a long one. Uh, had a lot to say. Um, and I apologize that this was uh, delayed today. Uh, I'm trying to get these out around 6 p.m. Maybe that's not the right time. I don't know. It, 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 leave a comment. What do you think? Should I, should I aim for 6 p.m.? Should I aim for 7 p.m.? What are your thoughts on, on that, on the time frame of when these things get released? Um, I like 6 p.m. because if, if people are working from home, um, you know, uh, and people are uh, getting off work or something along those lines, it seems like 6 p.m. is a good, a good, good time, right? Like even, even if you are still going to an office or some sort of uh, alternative location, uh, for uh, whatever work or, or what have you, 6 p.m. is like you have the enough time to get back, decompress, maybe eat some dinner and sit down and watch this thing. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, leave a comment. Let me know. Let me know your thoughts on that. Um, 
other than that, you know, uh, same old spiel. Share, subscribe, uh, make sure you're getting the notifications. Um, and if you have the ability to, feel free to donate. Uh, ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be grounded till, till maybe j middle of June. I'm not really sure. Uh, we'll see how long this thing keeps going. Uh, these videos are going to be, uh, coming at you, working on a lot of other projects as well, trying to do the best that I can to talk about some interesting topics that I think are important, um, that I think can build community and uh, bring us together and educate us about some things and, and give us hope. That's that's kind of the goal that I have is um, even if it's bad news, I hope that we can pull something out of it that can give us some hope to move forward. Uh, that is my goal. That is the, the point of this, uh, a lot of this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you tomorrow. But till then, see you on the road.